Hey, everybody. Welcome to Roll Back. What is Roll Back? I'm so glad you asked. Roll Back is where we share the best conversations from our pre-video audio only catalog with you right here on YouTube for the very first time. And today we bring you the story of the man who fast talked his way into a recording contract right out of college, the man who co-created and sold companies like Marquis Jet and Zico Coconut Water, the guy who co-owns the Atlanta Hawks NBA franchise with a few friends and freely shares his wisdom and his experience in a very entertaining way on his highly popular and quite addictive Instagram account, inspiring millions of people across the world. I'm talking, of course, about the one, the only, Jesse Itzler. Jesse is quite the character. He eats only fruit before noon. He runs 100 mile races. He raises millions for charity. And when he isn't playing super dad to his four kids, he's an in-demand motivational speaker with a life highlighted by one predominant theme, never be afraid to fail. And despite all of his many successes in 2010, Jesse felt that his life had kind of settled into a too comfortable routine. So he did what any rational human would do, right? He invited a Navy SEAL to move in with him. But this was no ordinary Navy SEAL. This was the one and only David Goggins. And Goggins accepted Jesse's invitation on one condition. And that condition was for 31 days, Jesse had to do every single thing that David asked him to do, no exceptions. And the result was Jesse's book, Living with the Seal, which was the subject of this exchange from episode 197 that was recorded way, way back in November of 2015. So please hit that subscribe button and enjoy this very old, but still very relevant conversation with Jesse Itzler. I'm, uh, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time, man. So this is super cool. I feel like you're, uh, you're like this, uh, sort of Gen X version of Zelig. You've lived all these different lives, different chapters in, <laughs> in many different ways in a really, uh, we have that in common in a cool way. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I think like I was trying to think as I was driving over here, I was like, what, are, what is like the overarching, you know, sort of theme or marching order of your life. And, and you know, it really boils down to, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, being fearless, you know, not being afraid to fail and allowing yourself to get out of your comfort zone, which is obviously, you know, a predominant theme in, in, in the new book. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that sums it up pretty good and, and doing things differently, just mm -hmm. not intentionally differently, but just looking at challenges and saying, you know what, that would be a great on my life resume. Uh huh. The resume that you refuse to write down though. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, that's the thing, right? You've never had a resume. Right. Just right. a life, a life resume in your mind. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, I mean, where do you think that? Where does that germinate from? I mean, were your parents like that? Is you know, where did that kind of sensibility come from? Well, first of all, it's a lot more fun living outside, living in yeah. you know, outside of your comfort zone and trying different things. But I just, you know, I was, I was just, I've always been a check the box guy. You know, finish one thing and not really dwell on oh, that was a good accomplishment or, or whatever, and just look for the next challenge. Mm -hmm. I've always just always wanted to kind of keep going and keep trying to find new things that would excite me. I get bored easily. So I like to just, I need, I'm one of the, I guess, you know, so many of us need a goal or something to train for. So I'm always looking for the next thing, whether it's business or physical uh -huh. or whatever. Were you, were you like hyperactive as a kid? Did you have <laughs> trouble like sitting down in class? Um, I didn't recognize that at the time, but now that I look uh, back on it, for sure. Yeah, yeah, you would have probably been medicated if you were a kid yeah, now, I know, right? Like I know. for not being able to focus and everything like that. Well, um, I mean, there's, you know, we can track back and go through the music career and and all your kind of entrepreneurial ventures, but you know, let's camp out um, uh, in in the book right now. Sure. Tell me a little bit about. Uh, about the book and kind of how this whole thing got sparked. Sure, well, the book's called Living with the Seal. And um, I was at a 24 hour race in San Diego a couple of years ago. And I was running the entire race as part of a six person relay team with friends. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy next to me literally set up his little station next to me was running the entire race alone. And he caught my eye because he was about 265 pounds, which is a, a lot of weight to carry in a, uh, you know, in a 24 hour race that you're running by yourself. 
and the race was unsupported. So we had to bring all of our own supplies. And at the time I just sold the company and I, I probably overdid my supplies. I had wow. a tent, a masseuse, you know, <laughs> bananas, like I think Whole Foods pulled up. And this guy next to me literally sat in a folding chair with a bottle of water and a bag of crackers mm -hmm. with his arms crossed with this like, don't even think about messing with me look. And I was just like, who is this guy? And at mile 70, he had broken all the small bones in both of his feet and had kidney failure. And I watched this guy literally just on pure guts finish this race. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who in the world is this? So I Googled him. He had a fascinating backstory, which we can get to if you want. And I, I decided I wanted to meet him. I cold called him. And I literally just picked up the phone, called him. He wasn't super chatty. So I said, you know what? <laughs> Yeah. Let, let me get on a plane and come see you. Uh -huh. And um, after about 10 minutes of just sitting with him, I said, my life would be a lot better if whatever he had psychologically, whatever made this guy tick, rubbed off on me a little bit. And I invited him to move in with my family and I. And uh, three days later, he was at our breakfast table. Mm -hmm. And the idea was he's going to live with you for 31 days. And the only rule is that you've got to do everything that he says, or he asks of you. Yeah, right? and I, I wanted to get in great shape. At the time, I was in a, I was in a good routine or I thought it was a good routine. Uh, and so many of us live our life on routine and routines are great, but they're definitely a, could be a rut. And I wasn't getting better. My routine was great, but it was, I wasn't improving in any of the buckets in my life. And that, but, but you're such a high performer in so many other areas of your life. Like your bar is already set pretty high in comparison to the average person. So, you know, to me, it would take some, you know, it takes a deep level of self-awareness to go, no, I can still, there's still room there. Yeah. I mean, at the time I was, I was doing a bunch of marathons. My times weren't getting better. My training wasn't, I was just doing it. I was going through the motions, but I wasn't at all giving it my all. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get that mojo. It's hard. You know, the, the one thing that he really taught me, and you can, I, I'm sure you, you can relate to this through everything you've done. Mm -hmm is we're all disciplined in our own ways, but to be consistently disciplined, consistently disciplined is so hard. That's the hardest part. Right. And, and he was the most, dis, you know, the most of the most at the highest level <laughs> of consistency and discipline. Um, his name is David Goggins. It's since, you know, in the book, I refer to him as Seal, but his name is David Goggins. And uh, he came in and he just turned everything upside down from and, day one. And, and how much of it was purely like, I just want to get in physical, great physical condition versus, you, you know, beyond that, like sort of the, the, the mental discipline, the emotional discipline that would spill over into other areas of your life. Like, were you thinking about that at the time or was this purely like a fitness boot camp? At the, when I first kind of put my hand out and shook his hand across from the table and said, let's move, you know, he'll move in with me. It was predominantly, I wanted to get in great shape. But after two hours of him at my house, it, it, it flip-flopped. And the psychological side of it and what makes him tick and how is he so driven became 80 to 90% of it. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was gonna get in good shape. That was unavoidable. I mean, he's a, he's a machine, but I really wanted so much more because you, know, you go in and out of shape, you, you go through these peaks and valleys up and down, but the mental side of it, you can really, can last a lifetime. Right. So I, 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 and I got all these different little sound bites and tidbits of living with him. I mean, the first day that he came here in two hours into our journey, we went down and he wanted to see how many pull-ups I could do. And by the way, he has set the Guinness Book of World's yes. Records for most uh, pull-ups in a day. He's done 4,030 in 17 hours. Mm -hmm. So pull-ups for him weren't, weren't that difficult. Pull-ups for me, a 200 pound guy that doesn't do any was very tough. So I squeezed, I did like eight. So I get off the bar and try it again in 30 seconds. Got back on the bar. I did like maybe six. So I one more time, wait 30 seconds and try it again. And I barely got four and he turned and I was done. Like lactic acid mm -hmm. built up. My arms were like at a 90 degree angle. And he turned to me and he said, all right, we're not leaving here until you do a hundred more. And I said, I can't possibly do a hundred. Like impossible for me to physically, I might want to do it. I can't do it. And I said, no, you can do it. And we're gonna, I'm gonna prove it to you. We're not leaving this gym until you do it. So I would do one, walk around the gym, do another. But what he taught me, and I did it, but what he taught me is we all have so much more in our reserve tank than we think we have. Mm -hmm. And his saying, one of your saying that you've, you know, has resonated with you is that when your brain tells you 
you're done, you're really only 40% done. And, and, he, and he taught me that right, you know, there. He kind of- yeah. <clears throat> He, uh, I had heard him say that one time and I never forgot it. And as we were kind of chatting before the podcast, that's really, you know, that's something that I use in the talks that I give. And, and also, you know, it was a big sort of mantra when I was doing Epic Five, when I would hit those low moments. And it's so true. It's so incredibly true and it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and when I'm reading your book, um, you refer to him as Seal. He's anonymous. Uh, but to me, I'm like, I know immediately this, this the only person this could be is David Goggins. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like anybody in the endurance community would identify him immediately because there is no other human being like this guy on planet Earth. Right. Um, but I'm interested in, you know, why it was anonymous. I know that it, now it's public, I think maybe a week ago or whatever. Yeah. He was cool with like coming out and doing press about it. But was he, you know, reticent to participate in this on a media level or like what was the, you know, reason why he was anonymous throughout until recently? Well, when he moved in with me, I decided to keep a blog of our training regimen and I sent it out to just 30, 40 friends. And during that time, I just referred to him as Seal just because I thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. It resonated with guys and the blog really caught on and it led ultimately to this book. And I just wanted to keep it consistent with the blog. There wasn't like, you know, anything deeper than that. But I also wanted people that didn't know like you, David Goggins and the name or could Google him or whatever um, to get their own mental vision of, of what this guy looks like and is. Right. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. so interesting. And, and for people that are listening that don't know who he is, uh, he's a Navy SEAL. He's been a Navy SEAL for like, I don't know, over 20 years yeah. probably yep. at this point. Um, who uh, has suffered the loss of, of many a fellow uh, soldier. And around, I think, I, I want to say it was around 2007 or so to honor, uh, you know, his fallen brethren. I think he had six friends of his who died in helicopter accident or That's something right. like that, uh, decided that he was going to tackle like the 10 most challenging endurance challenges on the planet. Right. And he just set about like, checking the boxes. You know, he'd never been a runner. The guy's enormous, right? Yeah. <laughs> like he is not like a, the typical triathlete runner. He never owned a bike, he, you know, like on sheer force of will, he one by one, like knocked these things off. And he, you know, by, I don't know how he got into his first hundred miler. I think he had to do something on a track to prove that he could do it. And he, uh, he that was another instance, I think, where he broke all kinds of bones. Well, that's and, the race that I know, saw that, him at. Oh, I saw him one? at his first, at yeah, his yeah, first yeah, one. Yeah. So. Unbelievable. And, and on a personal level, you know, when I was going through like my transformation and my journey, uh, I was trying to think of a challenge uh, that would get me excited and scared and all of those things and was contemplating an Ironman when I picked up a magazine article and I talk about this in Finding Ultra. Uh, and it was a story about this race Ultraman, but really it was a story about this guy, David Goggins, who had come off bad water, had never really, he, I don't think he'd ever even done a triathlon at all and had gotten into this Ultraman race didn't own a bike, borrowed a bike, didn't have cycling shoes or cleats or anything like that. He actually taped his tennis shoes to his pedals. And through this incredible, you know, mental acumen that he has and, and, and force of will still placed relatively high in this race. Yeah. And I was so amazed by that, that that was like the seed that, you know, was planted for me to contemplate the idea that perhaps I could try this race. And so he's sort of, you know, a spirit animal to me, even yes. though, I mean, I, I've met him a couple of times. I wouldn't say that, you know, I know him well, um, but truly a remarkable human being in, in every category. And unlike any other person you're ever going to meet. And an unlikely roommate for my wife and I. <laughs> yes. Perhaps the most taciturn uh, and, and serious, gravely serious uh, person, you know, I've ever encountered. When he walked into my house and this is in the book, uh, I said, you know, look, go ahead, take your bags, make yourself at home. And he said, nah, he said, I don't have a home. Yeah. This is your home. And I said, no, the make yourself at home is an expression. And he turned right to me and he goes, I don't operate in expressions. I was like, <laughs> you're like, I'm like, okay. It's going to be a long 31 yeah. days. Cause you're like a jocular fun guy, you know? Yeah, like, you, know you must be thinking like, there's gotta be a way into this guy. Like, how am I going to crack his, you know, emotional core and totally. get, to the, get to the reality of like who this person is. Right. I also thought, look, we'll, we'll, run, we'll watch some football games, we'll go to some dinners, you know, like I was the big, <laughs> the, you know, that, that got thrown out the window. He, he literally took, we lived at the time in New York City in a great building on Central Park West. He took all the furniture in the guest room where he was sleeping, mm -hmm. moved it to the side and blew up an inflatable tent 
that takes the oxygen out of the room to increase your like red blood cell, whatever, and slept in a tent in our apartment. Like an altitude tent. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, there's amazing uh, anecdotes in the book. There's one story where I think you come in and he's just sitting in front of the window, like looking out the window. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yeah, like his, his ability to just patiently and quietly sit without, uh, you know, encountering- uh, Or stalk. Any distractions. Yeah, yeah. or stalk, yeah. Um, is is quite amazing. So how did it go when you crack this news to your wife? Like, hey, here, I got this idea. This is what's going to go down. So, well, my wife is an entrepreneur. She owns a company called Spanx and she's always lived her, her, her life way out of the box. She's put herself out there. She's a huge risk taker. That's a theme in her life. And um, I always say she's 50% Einstein and 50% Lucille Ball. And I think when I told her that we're having a, a guest move in, I got her at a Lucille, Lucille Ball moment uh -huh. because she didn't really register with her. So I immediately said, you know, went to onto the next thing. I kind of got like a half approval uh -huh. and went on to the next topic. Yeah, it's and, not really registering what that's yeah. actually going to mean. And I said it really fast. Like we're having a guest, Navy Seal, you know, like uh -huh. subliminally kind of snuck it in. So I, I could tell her that I gave her the information, but I didn't give her all the information. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so tell me the first thing that happens when he comes in. So, well, first of all, he, he only had a nap, you know, he came for 31 days with nothing. Mm -hmm. All his belongings were in a small backpack, which was amazing because it was the winter. And, um, you know, I showed him to him, like I told you, we went down and did these pull-ups, uh, did that pull-up challenge. And- um, That was right out, like right when he arrived. Right out of the gate. And then that night he told me that I'd be sleeping in a chair to get out of my comfort uh -huh. zone. And he wanted me to feel what suffering to start to feel what, what suffering is. So, you know, I could enjoy it as he would say. And, um, but no, every day, you know, he had an expression every day we have to do something that sucks. And we did. And, um, you know, he just wanted me to, he wanted me to take my baseline, which I thought was, I was operating at a high level and just really reset it and raise the bar. Because once it gets reset, your baseline just gets raised. You can't really go back. Mm -hmm. And and all the challenges, all the workouts, you know, we did some crazy stuff. Jumped in a frozen lake. We did insane runs and blizzards and all this other stuff. But it was all about raising the baseline to get better mm -hmm. and um, getting out of your comfort zone. You know, that's it, that term is overused, but you really to the only way to really get better is to experience pain, to get uncomfortable, and to go to places that you don't want to go and improve. Right. And it, it's interesting for a guy like you, because I mean, literally you, you have choices most people don't have. Like you could choose to spend your time however you like without really a concern for resources. And most people in your scenario would opt for, you know, sort of lavish vacations and, you know, whatever, like the path of least resistance and sort of only doing things that sort of pique your interest. And here you are kind of welcoming this person into your life that is going to completely shake that up and force you to, you know, confront yourself in a way that you don't really, you could go to your grave without ever having to do and be none the wiser or, you know, suffer nonetheless. And I think that's why he decided to, to, to move in with us. I and think, that was my next question. Like, why would he agree to do this? I think that he, he recognized that I, you know, that, that there was authentic passion for wanting to get better. There was a strong appreciation for him. I had so much respect for what he was doing and <clears throat> what he's done for our country. And I think part of him too, I think, you know, to live with two entrepreneurs, I think there was a little bit of like, let me see what another world looks like. Yeah, that's him. about as uncomfortable for him as it is for you to Absolutely. jump into a frozen lake. Absolutely. Because I can't, it's hard to even picture that guy in New York City at all, let alone like sort of in your fancy apartment building. I know. <laughs> I, no. I mean, it's comical. It was, and the book's fun. I mean, that's the, that's the whole fish out of water part of the book. It's really funny. But yeah, I mean, women with poodles in their, you know, pocketbooks or in the elevator with him, he's, you know, he's probably jumped out of parachutes in foreign countries and done mm -hmm. things that we, you know, some other stuff that I don't even know about that, right. were, that, that were helped our country and this and that. And here he is in this fancy building. Um, and he was just, you know, he was just so determined. At, at everything. I mean, everything was perfect form, perfect execution, you know, on time. And a lot of that rubbed off on me, you know, not just physically, but even at work. You know, I've lost many deals to just negotiation fatigue. 
you know, I don't have great negotiation endurance. I'd rather run. A lot of times I'll just be like, you know what? It is what it is. I'm not going to, let's just, I want to go run. Fine, done. Shake on it. And um, he just, every everything that he did in his life, even the way he cleaned his room in the beginning, you know, or made his bed was perfect. Mm-hmm. It had to be done. In fact, this is really interesting. I asked him now, like, what else is left on your bucket list? Like you've done all these amazing things. And he said to me, literally, this is two days ago. He said, there's nothing left. He's done everything he wants to do. What he's doing now is he's going back through the things that he's already done, like bad water, Mm -hmm. that he thinks he could do better and trying to improve the things on his bucket list that he's already done. Interesting. Yeah, there's a one of his kind of uh, pearls of wisdom throughout that's peppered throughout the book is this idea that it's it's less about what you're doing, it's when you're doing it and how you're doing it. Yeah, that like commitment to doing whatever you're doing, however mundane it is, to do it the best that you can do with this relentless like focus, like the ability of him to like be super present in whatever he's doing without any distraction. Right, now part of that is he has, you know, the luxury of having a super simple life, right? He doesn't have a lot of distractions and- um, yeah, He's not on Facebook or Twitter. No, or <laughs> no. Why would he do that? that yeah. I mean, he could be doing pushups. Exactly. Um, so, and that's part of it. But, you know, he, I, I always felt like during our days that we had, we were operating with 27 or 28 hours in a day. We were so, I was so more efficient at work, even though I was doing so much more physically mm-hmm. and we were training so long, I was getting so much more done at work because all the non-essential things that, you know, he would just be like, eliminate them. Meetings, I didn't, you know, and then maybe I would take that I didn't need, lunches, this and that. And he would find, you know, a lot of us think if we don't work out in the morning, ah, I miss my workout, I'll do it tomorrow. If we had a 15 minute break during him, he shadowed me everywhere I went. He mm-hmm. came to every meeting, every meal, everything. And um, if they'd be like, let's take 15 minute break to check emails and go to the bathroom. He'd be like, How, all right, let's go do as many burpees as we can in 10 minutes. Right. And then take five minutes to do, to do your stupid emails. Yeah. And there's that time where he made you do that during a break and like a negotiation or a business meeting and yeah. you're in a suit and you have to come back. <laughs> yeah. <also. laughs> yeah. Just finding that, that, that little sliver of extra time throughout your day. Like, and, and he you're always care. working out. Like, it's not like you worked out and you're done. Like it's a constant... Uh, you know, search for that little moment of time that you could maximize and use more efficiently. And he did, you know, we would, Mm -hmm. if we were traveling and we would get home at 11 o'clock and he felt like the day wasn't complete, like we didn't get enough done. He would say, all right, we still have 50 minutes left. We're going to maximize those those 50 Mm -hmm. minutes in the day. Were you game throughout? Was there ever a moment where you're like, all right, man, come on. Like, or a breaking point where you're like, it's too much, or you thought you weren't going to make it? Several times, several times. And I just didn't want to let him down. You know, he was, it was just so motivating. It's one thing to read about inspiration. It's another thing to live with inspiration. And when you, when I was just being around him and knowing what he's done, like you said, taping his feet to a bike and, you know, all this crazy stuff, I I can't go out for a 50 minute run. I mean, it was just impossible to say no to him. Um, And then after two or three weeks, when it became habit, it, I would look forward to it. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, oh, I can't wait for it to suck today. Interesting. And and um, so it was real. It was really interesting. And you know, I would bring him to these business meetings, and I, I remember specifically we went to meet with Kevin Garnett from uh, who at the time was playing with the Celtics, who was a Gatorade endorse. You know, he's endorser for Gatorade, and but he was also really into what he puts in his body Mm -hmm. and his contract was coming up. And we thought for my coconut water company, Zico, he'd be a great fit as an endorser. So I brought Goggins with me Mm -hmm. and we go to pitch in Boston, Garnett. And I introduced them and I said, oh, this is David Goggins. He's a Navy SEAL. He's living with me to train me. And for the next two hours, those guys just went back and forth about fitness, you know, what they put, what they put in their body, food, this and that. And in the end, they gave them, they gave each other a bear hug and they said, all right, great meeting. Uh-huh. And I'm like, what about Zico? And Garnett turned to me and he said, look, whatever you guys are doing, I'm in. 
Uh-huh. So he was like the, the ultimate, ultimate closer. Without question. I mean, <laughs> guys were so fascinated with him. I was uh-huh. like, I wish I could bring him everywhere. It's an incredible accessory that you could bring into the boardroom. <laughs> uh, no, there's, you paint that scene really beautifully because it starts off with you're, you being nervous about, you know, how this is going to go in this negotiation. You bring David in and immediately like Kevin is in this sort of staring contest, like trying to figure out who this David guy is. He's not hearing right. anything that you're saying. Nothing. <laughs> like, right. It's really great. It's hysterical. Uh-huh. I'm going through a whole pitch and then he just turns to Gog and he's like so what do you do during a day you know then right. that was it then the floodgates open uh-huh. and those guys had their their conversation and uh-huh. I don't think there was anybody who could beat David in a staring contest no no way no right <laughs> Um, and also I love the part about like sort of just walking, like walking across Midtown and you're wearing like 50 pound weight vests and he's got his eyes. It's like, he's in Fallujah, you know, yeah. he's like spotting, <laughs> we got to cross the street, you know, like looking for, you know, enemy sight lines the whole time. Yeah. He had these, he got two weight vests that we would wear when I, and walk to work. I would wear a suit some days, not often. And you're wearing some, the, you're wearing the weight vest underneath your suit. Yeah. Underneath it and some days over it, but usually under, but, but. Sometimes we'd be exposed and we look like we're going to go blow up a building. Right. I mean, he Did looks- anybody ever stop you? It, people, they, they couldn't stop us because they'd run to the other side of the street. Uh-huh. I mean, they were freaked out. I was freaked out. I thought, you know, like it was unsafe. And this is 2010, right? Yeah. When this was happening? Yeah. 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 So it was, um, it, he loved the weight vest. He would wear the weight vest like it was, you know, he would put it on like he just, he was putting on the the- the jacket after he won the masters. Uh-huh. I mean, celebrate it. He would welcome it. He would sleep in it. Uh-huh. He loved, he just loved challenge. Right. It couldn't be hard enough. And he, as, as I recall, I think he had a heart thing that mm-hmm. was going on with him that, that took him out. Like, cause he didn't compete for a number of years yeah. and he was kind of gone. Like I, I, I didn't see him anywhere. I didn't see his name anywhere. I think that might've been around 2009 or something like that. Did that, did he have surgery or they got rectified or how did that get? So he's, he's, he accomplished all these amazing physical feats with literally, I believe like 60%, only 60% of um, capacity of his heart. He had, a, mm-hmm. he had a huge hole in his heart and he has sickle cell. So he's, oh, he's yeah, he's sickle cell. So he, um, it's just an amazing story. I mean, I, anyone listening should Google David Goggins and, and get more about his story. Or you know, a lot of it is in my book, Living with the Seal. But um, it's just you know, guys like this are rare. And when you can pull things out of their their journey to help your personal life, whether it's training or work, and I, I was fortunate, I got both out of it. Um, it just makes you so much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, it's a lost sensibility in our culture. You know, now it's all about the life hack or what's the shortest route to get, you know, to get to the end game. And here's a guy who's so fully committed to the process, the journey. He's actually seeking out the most difficult route as opposed to finding the shortcut. Right. And in that finding, you know, finding the thing to celebrate is overcome. You know, it's like, if it's easy to do, then what is that? What are you gaining out of that? It's only through confronting and overcoming and, and, you know, getting to the other side of that thing that you thought you could never do that enriches your life. And also I would just add one thing, you know, so many of us have finished lines. I'm going to run the New York marathon. And when you train for that one specific thing, Mm -hmm. you celebrate it with a party with your friends you hang the me- the medal up and the pictures up, and you said, "Okay, it's on my resume. I did the New York Marathon." He has no finish lines. No, it's like once that's done, what's the next race? You know, what's the next thing to do? Yeah, he Check doesn't the dwell box. for one second. I think when he did, he did Ironman World Championships one year. He he parachuted into the swim, did the whole Ironman, and when it was done, he went out for a run. He's like, "It's just another workout." Right. Like he doesn't make too big of a deal out of anything. Right. You know? Right. And so. It's, it's a valuable lesson as well. So, so what are like the biggest, you know, lessons that you take away from this? Like, you know, how has this impacted your life post David? I mean, it's been five years now. Um, you know, what are the biggest changes that have stuck with you that are still part of your daily life? Well, for, for starters, you know, definitely the same, you, just to reiterate what, what you dwelled, you tapped into on one of your races, the 40% rule is something that definitely resonates with me. I always think about, um, but just on a daily basis, it's, it, he's just been, he's just motivated to live a lot more, with a lot more grit. Grit is a great indicator of future success. And he was the grittiest, but just to live my life with, with as much grit, look for challenges that maybe stuff that I don't think I can complete and try to do it. 
always have something on my calendar that, you know, that I'm looking forward to that I can train for. And then what's next after that? I'm building out a schedule. Um, I'm way more efficient with my time. I've eliminated a lot of the non-essential stuff Mm -hmm. in my life. I'm trying to live more simply. My life's a little complicated. His life was so simple. Um, And I think he didn't really want what I had. And I wanted a lot of what he had without getting rid of what I had. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't want to downgrade my, my house or my apartment, but I wanted the simplicity. So I'm trying to, to, to live a real, you know, simple, as, as simple as I can. And what, um, would, what would be an example of something that maybe you, you cut loose? Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fancy guy. I'm not into fancy dinners. Um, we've talked about, you know, I only eat fruit until noon, but even just wardrobe, you know, I mean, I'll, I want to, in my closet, as soon as he left, one of the first things I did was go through and say, you know what? I only want to have 20 things in my closet for this season. Instead of having a couple of jackets and a couple of this, I'm like, I'm going to take the two that I like, the two sweaters, Mm -hmm. the t-shirts, the running shorts, and that's it. And I loved it. It felt so clean. And it just, it, it felt even that one little, small little change opened up stuff at work. I felt it just opened up a theme that -hmm. stuck with me about just simplifying things and not, you know, I didn't feel like I had to return every email. I didn't feel like emails owned me. I took control of my own email. So I didn't feel like I had to respond in five minutes to every email and be beholden to that or, or, you know, oh, this guy's going to get mad if I don't respond to the emails. That's a big one. What gives someone the right that someone emails me? What gives that now they don't can, what gives them the right to think that I have to email them back immediately? Why do I have to stop what I'm doing with my kids or my family and return that email? Shouldn't that answer be on my terms? And, you know, pre-Goggins, I would be like, oh man, so I got to get back to him right away. Post-Goggins, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go get, I'm going to put me first. Putting me first was a big, a big takeaway from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've kind of created this pie chart about how you allocate your time every day, right? Yes. Tell me what that looks like. Well, I, you know, I, I, um, I draw a circle and I start with, okay, I need seven hours of sleep. That's kind of where, where my, I'm comfortable operating on seven. Six isn't good for me. Eight's probably a little too much. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, I have 17 hours left in a day. How do I want to spend it? And I literally put three hours for me. And that three hours of time could be a run. It could be sitting in a sauna. It could be doing emails. It could be doing, watching TV. But the Jesse time is something that I definitely prioritize. And then I have time, a certain amount of allocated time with my wife and my family. And, and the rest is pretty much work. And that's how I break up my day. And I approach it. It's pretty much the same breakdown every day, but I do change it depending on what's going on. But I always make sure that I have three hours for me and a certain amount of time for my wife and my kids. Mm-hmm. And so does the training fall into that three hours if you're gearing up for a race? Mm-hmm. If I'm gearing up, I might extend it a little bit. You know, I usually, training, I usually actually keep as a separate, the three hours usually doesn't even include the training because again, if you're efficient with your time, 24 hours, try to fill up on a pie chart, 24 hours. If you have, if, if seven of it's sleep, you still have 17 hours. Mm-hmm. If you're efficient at work and you work, you know, X amount of hours, you still have a lot of time. Right. And you know what? Get up an hour earlier. Right, right, right. Yeah. That's, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm always trying to find balance with that, you know, and I, it's like, I feel like I vacillate between extremes. Like in the meta, there's balance. Like if you look back over the course of a year, my life looks really balanced. But on a day-to-day basis, trying to get that mix right, like to achieve that pie chart every single day is something that is always eluding me. But even if you're working a full-time job and you work eight hours a day and you sleep six, you have 10, you have 10 hours. You have 10 hours to allocate. So even if I, I I'm trying to just figure out now how I even do it even if you ran three hours a day and spent three hours by yourself and three hours with your family, you still have an hour. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of time if you don't dilly dally. Right. And you know, he didn't dilly dally. He, there was no dilly dallying. The dilly dallying would be like, you know what? I got downtime. I'm going to do some sit-ups. Mm-hmm. It, everything was maximized. Now, of course, it's unrealistic for us to all live our life to that extent, but there's, but there's pieces of it we can pull out to get better. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you were able to, you know, crack his exterior and 
figure out what it is that drives him? Like what's behind that, that has created this, you know, this person? Well, I talk about it with him and I I talked to to him about it because it's just, it's so unique. And, you know, his motivator, we all have our own motivation. His motivator was anger. He had a really tough childhood. He, you know, he has a lot of anger inside, but he's been able to channel that Mm -hmm. on a daily basis whenever he needs it. And, and, and that's really what, you know, what drives him. Um, he likes to look at his life as like a wet rag that you, you know, you kind of s- squeeze out all the water. He wants to squeeze and, and he looks at the rag, like it's his soul. And he wants to squeeze out every single drip drop of water out of his soul to know that he's maximized his time on earth. Mm-hmm. But I think in some respects, it can be said that, that, you know, when your fuel is anger, that's an unsustainable fuel source, right? You're going to, you're going to burn out. Like at some point, is there a way to confront that fear, work through it, get to the other side and, and be able to operate, you know, from a different place. And, you know, did you sense like there's a, that he holds onto that? Like if he was actually to confront that and work through it, that suddenly he wouldn't be the person that he is anymore, or he wouldn't have that drive. (sighs) I think, well, I think he definitely still taps into the angle. He might be the exception to the rule. He might be that one asterisk, <laughs> like on the you bottom of the page, like, yeah. you know, uh, this doesn't apply to everyone asterisk. It does apply to David Goggins. Um, I think he's also set up just, he's, con- he's, he has such control of his mind. He's convinced himself that he can just do it or he's going to try to do it no matter what. And again, it goes back to being, the consistency and the discipline, he's consistently convinced himself that he's up for the task, that he can do it, that he was put on earth to see what he's made of. And, you know, um, you know, so I, for him, maybe the anger is something that, you know, that he can still hold on to. And maybe it is something that won't go away. I don't know. And maybe that's channeled with other emotions or other things or just the will to be the best or whatever it is. But whatever that potion is inside him, it's working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing, interesting thing about the book is that it's, it, it really is peppered with a lot of business advice. You know, it, it's not just, oh, here's how I got in shape and here's the workouts that I did and here's the pearls of wisdom that David was dropping on me. And, you know, sort of aside from, you know, him kind of being your, your accessory in these, in these business meetings, yep. there was some wisdom that you were able to kind of cull from hanging out with him that has applied to your entrepreneurial life. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've had multiple gigs. I had a private jet company called Marquee Jet and I had no experience or background in private aviation. Mm -hmm. I was in the music business. I had, um, I was a partner in Zico Coconut Water. So multiple, and there's always been a big learning curve. I've never, I didn't study to be in any of those fields. I don't think you can. And like we said, I've never had a resume. So I've always been like, you know, had had a combination of let me get my foot in the door and kind of figure the rest out later. Let me get the deal and I'm going to, I'll figure out how to make the deal work. So the first step has always been for me, getting the deal, getting the right partners, hiring my weaknesses, surrounding myself, you know, in, in filling the, the, the positions that I didn't want to play, but it's always been mixed with a, a, a real passion for stuff that I wanted to learn more about or, or, you know, get better at or, mm-hmm. or whatever. So, um, but there's no secret sauce, you know, it's the ability to not be scared to fail, to call audibles, um, and just, uh, you know, when you do fail, just know that you're just getting a little nudge that you're off course and, and get back on course somehow. Yeah. I mean, tracking back to the beginning of your, your career, you had this sort of audacity to, you know, I guess, is it fair to say bluff your way into you know, the, the music industry <laughs> as Jesse James, the rapper, and then, you know, take that opportunity once you're in the door to then translate it into, you had a song that was on the Billboard 100, right? Yeah. And then- and then realizing there was this niche in the sports arena field of writing these songs for these franchises and turning that into like a full blown business. Yes. Um, so, you know, do you think that, that, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this, that, uh, that your kind of audacity is just innate, or do you think that that can be taught? I mean, that fearlessness, you know, to be able to kind of walk into a room without a resume and sort of 
secure the desired result. Mm-hmm. Well, I had an, I always had the confidence that if I could get into the room and get, you know, connect the dots and, and put myself in the game that I could figure out how to get to the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. And um, when I got my record deal, you know, I, I, I faced rejection probably 20 times. I sent out like everybody that's trying to get a record deal in the eighties, a cassette with a three song demo to all the various record labels in New York and LA and didn't hear one single word back. And then I would call these labels and nothing. And I didn't have a lawyer. My dad owned a plumbing supply house. I didn't have a powerful lawyer. I'm like, how in the world am I going to get a record deal? Like, this is crazy. And one night I was at the studio in New York and one of my favorite rappers of the eighties, a guy named Dana Dane had an advanced cassette of his second album that no one had sitting on the board, the music board. Um, so I borrowed it, put it in my pocket. Hey, I just wanted to hear it. I was a fan of his, but when I went out to LA after college, I had read that the owners of a record label called Delicious Vinyl, which is a big independent, probably the hottest independent label in the early nineties. They had a song called Bust a Move, mm-hmm. Young MC and mm-hmm. Wild Thing from Tone Low. <laughs> the founders loved Dana Dane. So I, when I called up, I basically, through a lot of confusion, convinced them or led them to believe that I was Dana Dane. And I set up a meeting with the owner who was a huge fan of Dana's. Uh-huh. And, you know, they, they were referring to me as Dana on the phone and I was responding like, yes, you know, <laughs> Dana, you can come at two, come in at two to see Mike. I was like, great, I'll be there. And then when I rang the buzz, the buzzer, I said, I'm, I'm Dana here to see Mike. And Dana's an African-American guy from mm-hmm. Brooklyn. I'm a, a white guy from Long Island. Um, so obviously they didn't know what was what, but anyway, I get all the way into this guy's office. You're as in, so the, the his, goal was to just get in the office no matter what. Get in the office and handcuff myself until I get a deal uh-huh. or something, something. So first you've got to get over this hurdle of this guy being upset that you're not who you said you were. Right. 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 So how does that go? Well, so I, I he he comes in. By the way, he's now a great friend of mine. He signed my wedding license. Uh-huh. This guy's has become a great friend. And Dana is also a great friend. But um, no, so I'm sitting in the office and the secretary comes in and says, Dana, can I get you some water? I said, thank you. That'd be great. They bring water in and I'm waiting for Mike Ross, the owner of this label to come in. And he comes in and he says, who the hell are you? Where's Dana? I said, oh, you know, Dana's running a little bit late. I said, but I have, uh, I have his cassette. You know, why don't we put it in? I said, in fact, I have my cassette too. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, oh, so I've been making music with Dana for years. It just started really confusing him even more. <laughs> Uh, until finally he let me put my, my cassette in and I had a song called college girls and he, he listened to about 30 seconds of it. I'd already, which is a long time. That's a long, a long time. time. And I, I'd already built a little bit of credibility cause I had this cassette. I knew a lot of the right names and you know, I'd mm-hmm. been around the scene a little bit and, um, he stopped this, my song and he said, you know, this is great. Would, would you be willing to give this song to tone Loke, one of his artists? And, um, and that led to, I didn't, but it led to dialogue and, you know, going down the path and ultimately my record deal. Right. That's amazing. And is it that same, you know, sort of spirit that you, that you took to Marquee Jet? Everything. You know, how did that, how did that happen? Everything in my life has been like that. I, um, Marquee Jet, similar thing. You know, um, I was a guest on a private jet, loved the experience. My partner and I, we're, we're literally sitting in the back of our, a friend of ours who invited us on a trip on one of his planes. And we were like, this is unbelievable. How do we fly like this more often? And um, came up with this idea for a 25 hour flight card, which ultimately became Marquee Jet and had this great, you know, we, we really thought that there'd be a, a huge market for people that would want to buy this 25 hour prepaid card. Problem was we had no airplanes. Uh-huh. So we had to go to NetJets, who was the 800 pound gorilla. And um, I gotten a call about a year prior to that from a friend of mine who had who wanted to put one of his friend's daughters, uh, wanted to get tickets to a Christina Aguilera concert and knew that I knew the manager from my days in the music mm-hmm. business. So um, not only, and I didn't know who the guy was, but not only did we get this gal, the 16 year old uh, for her birthday tickets, we she had, she had the opportunity to be a background singer on the stage. The guy was gonna do wow. me a favor, the manager. And it turns out, that the fellow who was, whose daughter it was, was this guy, Jim Jacobs, who was the president of NetJets. Ah. So when we had this idea a year later, 
I call him. Now he doesn't know me. I was like the, the behind the scenes guy that facilitated this thing. I get him on the phone. I, again, just, he had no idea what I was talking about. I'm like, Christina Aguilera. He's like, you're Aguilera. I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, da, 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 da. I'm like, no, your daughter. And just started Harry Truman has this great line. If you, if you can't convince him, confuse him. Uh-huh. So that's kind of been my. I'm starting to get that. This yeah. is your tactic. Yeah. Just get everyone super confused. Yeah. It led to a meeting. And, you know, we, we, t- we took a meeting and presented our, our plan for Marquee Jet. And um, we were faced with a no, you know, like mm-hmm. this, this is not for us. We're not going to give two 30 year old kids, I was 30 at the time, um, our fleet of airplanes to try some kind of jet card program. And um, we ended up going back a week later. And instead of just taking that no, we brought in our own focus group of athletes and entertainers and um, agents that talked about one by one, got up, we literally set up chairs like it was a focus group and discussed why they would never buy a share of an airplane or their own airplane, but they would buy what we were proposing, this 25 hour card. And, and it ended up being a, a, a really big business. That's interesting. I mean, why didn't, uh, with that knowledge, why wouldn't NetJets just create that internally? I think two reasons. Take that I, idea. I think one, they didn't, I don't think they really thought it would be as big as it became. And two, we were, we were in that demo. We, we, we could reach that young customer and the athlete and talk to that guy better than they could. They were set up really to sell corporate and to high net worth, older individuals. We were selling to a much younger, we were selling to the Kobe Bryant's of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that they thought, well, if there's going to be any success, let's see if these guys can sell to that world. And we did. Yeah. The one thing I, that, that you really seem to get is the value and importance of having that kind of celebrity endorser. And that seems to be like a cornerstone of every business that you get into is making sure that it's sort of cool with those people, right? When they're signing on for it, that creates this ripple effect that then you know drives demand. Yes. And no, though, the no to that is the product has to be great because celebrity will get someone to buy the product once and they'll get you on the shelves but it won't get them to buy it twice. Mm-hmm. So you really have to, you have to win them with great product. Marquee Jet was a great product and Zico Coconut Water was a great product. I love that story of how you chased after Matt Damon and Ben Affleck when yeah. you found out they were going to be flying on some some other client of yours uh, share on their way to Sundance, right? Yeah, we just, we just started Marquee Jet and every day I got a manifest of who was on the planes, who, you know, who was flying with us. And um, Matt was a guest and Ben were guests of somebody else. I saw their name and I was in New York and I was like, we were trying to build out the Hollywood vertical. So I was like, I have to get them Mm -hmm. to sign up to our program. So I literally was in a cab. And um, at the time I was running a lot. I was wearing shorts. It was winter. I was in shorts. I'm not even kidding, going to work. And I said to the guy, take me to uh, LaGuardia. And I just got on a a plane to to LA because their plane was flying from LA to the Sundance Mm -hmm. Film Festival. So I flew to LA. I met him on the plane. I introduced myself as Jesse, one of the co-founders of Marquee Jet. And coincidence, I'm going to Sundance also. (laughs) Um, You know, do you mind if I guys, they had a huge upgrade scheduling um, just on a fluke. They had a big plane. Mm -hmm. So I could actually sit and kind of like with the staff where to sit or, or on like a jump seat. Mm-hmm. So I told them I was just going to quietly jump up if you needed me. Da, da, da. And then once we got in the air, I started talking to them. And um, Matt said to me that, that they were having a nice to meet you. He said, look, we're going to this project green light release. If you want to come, you can come meet us. Um, love to see you at the, at the event at Sundance. Now, first of all, I had no clothing. I had no hotel. Right. It's Sundance. Everything is sold out. It's freezing. <laughs> yeah. I'm in shorts. You have no hotel there. I have or any nothing. Place to stay. Nothing. And I'm like, oh, I got meetings, you know, this whole thing. And I get off the plane. So I, I get some stuff. I check into the hotel like 20 miles away. I'm like, you know what? I, I didn't close the deal. I got to go to this thing. So I show up to the Project Greenlight event. There's 2,000 people online. Uh-huh. I'm like, I'm not, how am I going to get into here? So I went right up to the front of the line. And I said, hey guys, I'm here with Matt and Ben. I'm on their advanced team to make sure that the tables are set up. The guy opened up the velvet rope, walked right in. <laughs> and then I went, I went upstairs to the VIP table and I took a black marker and I wrote my last name, Itzler, on a piece of paper. And I wrote reserved, another piece, piece of paper. And I put it on one of the, uh, on the tabletops next to Matt's table where it said uh-huh. like, you know, like the VIP thing. <laughs> and I literally walk in there, walked in there and sat next to those guys and uh, I, I asked them when they were flying home. They said, you know, we don't have anything booked yet. I said, why don't you guys fly home with me? Which I wasn't flying home. 
And uh, on the flight home, I sold them a card. Right. There you go. That's a great story, man. Yeah. We laugh the, about it still. The like, balls of that is incredible. But they did you tell them that whole yeah, how the whole thing? Came oh, out? yeah. They, they know the story. Oh, yeah. That. Now, like when I, I talk to those guys about it and we, they crack up. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. So, so when we got back on the plane, Matt's manager said to me, he said to turn to Matt on the plane ride home and he goes, what's the manager from the club doing on the, our plane? <laughs> no one knew what was going on. <laughs> that's great, man. So, so ultimately uh, you exit um, Marquee, it sells to, to Berkshire Hathaway, right? Yeah. Um, and at some point running enters the picture. Like when does that start to creep in? So I decided, um, you know, I ran this relay race um, years ago at, at, um, in San Diego, 24 hour relay. And it was wild because I got to see people run a hundred miles by themselves, which I never thought was even possible. Mm-hmm. And I just was always planted a seed in my head that it was something that I would love to see if I was capable of doing. And I decided I wanted to uh, raise money for a bunch of foundations. And I just signed up for this 24 hour race um, with a hundred, I, I was going to stop at a hundred if I got there. Mm-hmm. So, um, I took 90 days, um, off from work. I wouldn't say off, but committed 90 days during work to train for this race. And I trained like, I mean, I was going berserk morning, night, you know, I would work and then I would just to prepare for the sleep deprivation, I would work till 11 and then run till six in the morning and right. go back to work. You know, you know, all the, all mm-hmm. this stuff. And, um, so that's, that was really where I got the bug. And then, you know, running takes a lot. I'm a big six, two guy and I'm, I'm not really built like a runner, but, um, I got the endurance bug and started doing some stand up paddle races and anything that would, you know, just looked exciting. Right. And so, so how did that hundred miler go for you? It, you know, um, I had a really good game plan going in. I, I spent I spent these 90 days talking to anyone that ever run a hundred miles, reading everything, hydration, nutrition. I had a great game plan and I stuck to it until I couldn't stick to it Uh because, you know, as you know. And a hundred miles, it's going to break loose on you. It broke loose around 60 and 75, it it flew away. And uh, I just, you know, but I gutted it out, but it put me in a wheelchair. I was banged up. Uh, My hips and joints were really banged up and my feet were battered. I mean- Mm totally battered. Um, but I, you know, um, this is the best thing I ever did in my life. Mm-hmm. And you raised a bunch of money, right? Like yeah. a million and a half bucks. Yeah. And this is for the foundation that you started, right? Yep. And so, I distributed it to 10 different United US based charity, charitable organizations. Uh-huh. And does the, does the foundation still exist? It does. Like what's, what's going on with that? You know, um, I'm, I'm new to this whole philanthropy stuff. You know, I'm still trying to figure out what the best way to deploy resources is. Um, so I'm going to a lot of conferences and listening and talking to a lot of people, but the foundation still exists. Um, 100 Mile Foundation. 100 Mile Man Foundation, mile yeah. Man. Uh-huh. And um, since then, I've done multiple 100 mile challenges to raise money for the foundation. And I also put my own money into the foundation. But um, we did a 100 mile bike ride called City to the Sand from New York City to the Hamptons. And we had 100 CEOs that each raised 10 grand, so a million dollars. Mm-hmm. We've done a, a, a hundred mile spin spin thing in Central Park. Um, I've done a, a thing called Hell on the Hill in my backyard. I have a really big incline in my house in Connecticut. Uh, it's about a 35% grade. That's about a little less than a hundred yards. And um, we go up and down a hundred times, about eight and a half miles. Uh-huh. And the, but it's it's hard, <clears throat> really it hard. hard. It's really brutally hard. Uh, it only takes about you know. Uh, well, actually, Goggins won it this year. He won it at one fifty five. But it takes a regular human anywhere from three to four hours. Uh-huh. But it is brutal, right? And so, what does what does running mean to you? Like in your life equation, like how does that impact your family life, your you know your entrepreneurial life? Well, it's my form of meditation. So, you know, if I don't run, I, I, I feel way worse. It, it, it's not a good day if I don't run. I'm just not connected to myself. I'm not, you know, I'm a little grumpy, um, but it's become habit for me. It's just, it's worked into my pie chart. It's one of the things that I have to do. And it doesn't have to be a run. It could be a paddle. It could be burpees. It could be something, but the running, you know, I don't listen to music. 
it's a very spiritual thing for me. Um, and I just like to, it's just my way of clearing my head and starting my day. Mm-hmm. Never any music. Never. And in the, in the, in the hundred miler. I put it on, I, I had it, a playlist that I knew I would probably need to get me through some part of it. And it, I put it on at mile 93 mm-hmm. for the last couple of miles. I took it off, but no, I don't like to listen to music. I like to be totally clear in my thoughts. I get my best, do my best thinking when I'm running. Um, lately I've been run walking. I've been walking too, um, which I love. And um, that's my time. Where's the best place to run around here? Well, I'm, now I'm in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta yeah. full time. And um, the, the, there's a great, you know, in my neighborhood, there's a ton of runners. It's um, it's hilly. There's rolling hills. There's a nice four mile loop. So I do that a couple of times. There's some good hills and I love running steps. Uh-huh. So I'll go to the stadium and I'll just run steps for an hour or something. And I, I love that. Well, let's, that's a good time to, good place to segue into the Atlanta Hawks. So this is, this is new for you, right? Yeah. Part owner of the Hawks. Uh, tell me what that's like. Like, what is, you know, what is, what does that mean in terms of, you know, your involvement and your participation in the organization? Well, I'm a huge basketball fan. So, I mean, there couldn't be anything more fun. And I love our organization and our team. I've been a season ticket holder here in Atlanta for a couple of years. So I've, I've been around the organization and um, it's just such a pleasure and honor to work with the players and the staff we have. It's just, and the community, it's great. And, um, you know, we're new to this. We bought the team, a small group of a uh, bunch of guys that I knew, friends, um, and a couple of guys here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And um, we've only been on board for about three or four months. So we're still learning. Um, there's a lot of work to do, but uh, it's been, it's, I can't even explain it. It's just been phenomenal. It's so crazy that like the guy who's writing these theme songs for the teams, I mean, if anyone would have said like, this guy one day is going to be an owner of one of the franchises. I mean, you can't script that, man. No, it's, it's impossible. Yeah, It's, it's impossible so crazy. and lucky and fortunate. And um, believe me, I appreciate every minute of it. And uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it's been great. It's been great. So what is it, what it, what is it your involvement entail? Like, what does it look like in terms of your input or lack of input or your relationship with the players and, right. you know, all of that? Well, because I'm here in Atlanta, a big part of it is, is community related. We've built five basketball courts in the inner cities here in Atlanta um, recently. And we're, we have 25 more in the works. And um, so a combination of community efforts, a combination of some of the marketing stuff. I've done a lot of work in the past with the NBA. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, that's an area that I want to focus on and that I think we need some, we can get better in. And, um, you know, but all the basketball stuff, we leave for the coaches and the coaching staff and, and guys that have a lot more experience and expertise than myself and my partners. Uh huh. Well, these guys must know you have this book, obviously, out, right? Oh, yeah. So is that, is that, is, is your kind of like lifestyle habits? Uh, wearing off on any of the players? Uh, you know, I'm we're, we're, I'm lucky because um, one of the guys, Kyle Corver, one of our players, does a thing called the Masagi uh, every year, which is a Japanese term. I, I don't know the exact specifics, but basically, you do something that you do not think you could possibly finish that can completely test your will and challenge your soul. For example, and this is a guy on our team, right? So he it's loves like right up your alley. Yeah. Last year, he and a friend took. I believe it was like 60 or an 80 pound boulder and dropped it in five feet of ocean water. And they would dive down one by one and move the boulder for three miles. It took them like 17 oh, hours. Wow. And, you know, of course there's all kinds of challenges, physical, fatigue, mental. Uh-huh. And every year this guy, so when I heard this story, I'm like, this is perfect, uh-huh. perfect for me. So I gave Kyle the uh, the book and he loved it. He told me he started doing, you know, some of these push up and pull up challenges and, and this and that. So the guys, you know, look, I think they can relate to the whole hundred mile experience and mm-hmm. what the preparation that it took and the will um, and their professional athletes, they go through their same challenges. Like how do you get up for a game 80 times a year? I mean, it's a lot what these guys go through. You don't realize it. You say, oh, this is, these guys are getting paid to play basketball, but no, it's grueling. Yeah. It's physical, it's exhausting, there's travel. There's other life stuff going on, family, um, and they have to get up and perform every night. And we have a we have a team of guys um, that do that. I mean, they're diving for loose balls and jumping in the bleachers. So it's it's great to see. 
Have you ever thought about bringing David out to talk with the guys? Absolutely. Yeah. They all know the story and, and it's in the works. I mean, uh-huh. be a great motivator for yeah, these I love guys. That, man. That's fantastic. Very cool. All right. Well, you're, you know, you're married to, uh, you know, an amazingly successful entrepreneur between the two of you, you have, you know, very rich business lives. You also have three kids. How do you, how do you like find that work life balance in terms of making sure that you're attending to your relationship? You know, she's busy, you're busy, you're doing all these things. You've got this, you know, great family and right. young kids. So how does that work? Well, I'm not going to lie. It's hard. You know, um, I would be lying to say that it's not challenging. Sarah's got her business and a lot of responsibilities and and her foundation, which is a lot bigger than my foundation. And, um, you know, trying to, to, to manage all of this stuff with our kids is hard, but we, you know, we are, um, we're very mindful of our time. We make sure that we have a date night and we're date nights every week. We eat as a family all the time. We share ideas all the time. We carve out time for walks and try to make it work. Are you on each other's sort of board of advisors, you know, in terms of like bouncing ideas off each other in, in a business way? Or do you guys have rules around like when you talk about business and when you don't? We, you know what? We bounce new ideas off of each other a lot. We don't, I don't get it too into Sarah's business and she doesn't get too into mine. However, what better person to, or advisor than my wife? I mean, she's, she's just an incredible business mind, incredibly creative. So I have the luxury of turning to my left in the morning and saying, sweetie, what do you think of this idea? Mm-hmm. And getting, you know, the advice of, of, a of a consultant, of a high paid consultant. Mm-hmm. If she's like, no, it's a terrible idea. And then you go and do it anyway. She that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. She trumps everything. <laughs> in fact, if, if something she, is fully baked and she's like, you know what? This should be blue, not red. It's blue. Uh-huh. Yep. That's a smart man. <laughs> That's the marriage secret right there, right? Yep. I learned two things in this, in this marriage. One is I'm never going to question my wife's decisions when it comes to business or business decisions. Mm -hmm. And two is I'm not going to compete with her or anything because she's too good. Right. And sitting like for those that are listening, right, right to my left are two pictures hanging on the wall. One of her on the cover of Forbes and the other one on the cover of Time Magazine. So (laughs) I think she stands from a place of authority on this. Yeah. She's, she's unbelievable. Cool. Well, let's talk about the diet a little bit and then I'll, you know, we can, we can wrap it up, but um, you got a really interesting take on, on nutrition. Yep. Uh, only fruit before noon is that's what sort of grabs the the headline, but there's a lot more going on there too, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, I read a book called Fit for Life and, and I was fortunate enough to, to get this book early in my life when I was running my first marathon. Mm-hmm. And um, the book was written by a guy named Harvey Diamond and his wife, Marilyn Diamond. And um, I don't know what drew, what attracted me to the book, but I couldn't put it down. And one of the principles was to only eat fruit until noon because you know digestion takes more energy than anything and we want energy we don't want to use energy mm-hmm. so the more efficiently we can digest food and obviously the more processed foods the more meats the more animal products etc the harder it is to digest the less energy the bigger the breakfast the less energy so um that was one of the big takeaways for me and i tried it for 10 days i said you know what i've been eating bagels every morning i've been eating cereals um, and I just switched over to fresh cut fruit. When was that? How long ago was that? 92. Uh-huh. And uh, I was running my, getting ready to run my first marathon. And after about 10 days, I said, you know what? Let me go back and, and have my old breakfast. Let me make some bagels and eggs and this kind of thing. And I felt terrible. Yeah. And I was like, holy cow, this is unbelievable. And I lost weight. I got lean. I was running like a machine. I was recovering better. Everything got better. And then there were other takeaways in the book, not to mix proteins and starches, not to, you know, other, other takeaways, Mm -hmm. but, um, and it's been, it's been something that I've been unwavering on. I'm a vegetarian. I'm a vegan. I eat pretty much 80%. I'm I'm a vegan 90% of the time. I'm raw 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just been, you know, people ask me the same questions. They probably ask you, where do you get your protein? Right. All these things. Um, well, but also right now with this kind of low carb craze, like the idea that, you know, you shouldn't be eating fruit. That's like bad for you. You know, I'm sure you get a lot of questions like that. I eat 15 bananas a day. Yeah. I've never I missed a it. day of work. I've, you know, I've, I run all the time. I have crazy energy, at mm-hmm. least in my opinion. Um, I've never met anyone that's protein deficient. I just got all my blood work done. I think I, you know, I came back like I'm 18 years old. I'm 47. Not to jinx anything. Anything can happen. 
but on a daily basis, you know, I feel good. And I, I would say to everybody, you know, there's all kinds of theories, right? Have milk, don't have milk. Have fruit, don't have fruit. Too much sugar in fruit, too much this. Try different things and see how your body reacts and how you feel. For me, this worked great. And I haven't, I haven't changed off of the deviated from the path in 25 plus years. Mm-hmm. And, and how, does it, how does it work with your wife and your kids? Oh, they, my wife eats French fries and cheeseburgers and <laughs> eats like a linebacker. It's not rubbing off but, on her. But that's what works for her. Right. <laughs> and you know, for my kids, I, I, I have a couple of rules. One is, you know, the first thing in the morning for my six-year-old, he has to eat something that's alive. So I don't want him to eat something processed. And then if he wants to have a waffle, he can have a waffle, but I really encourage him to have a piece of fruit or fresh squeezed orange juice or a banana before the waffle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just encourage him to make healthy decisions. I mean, he's around me, so he knows my commitment to it uh, and how important it is to me. And I try to teach him as much as I can, but he's six. Right. And in this country, it's hard. And I'll tell you the hardest thing for me as a parent because of my passion for food is when my son goes to school and, you know, other parents are deciding what my parent, what my son is going to, is going to eat that day. Right. And especially at this age when the habits are just forming, right. And you want to be able to exercise some influence and control over that with an eye towards the long term, but then knowing that like, you know, most of their day or half of their day is at school where you're not involved in that. Right. And you know, you you guys, we're going to have- Right. So we're going to have a celebration for Thanksgiving or Halloween or whatever. You know, why do we have to have everything? Like, I mean, we, it's just crazy to me. So anyway, that's, that's challenging yeah, and do frustrating. The do the best you can. All right. I want to wrap it up with one final uh, inquiry around um, relationships. Cause I gather like from you and just, you know, sort of poking around the internet, uh, getting a sense of, of who you are and how you function that, you know, relationships are really at the center of your kind of success equation. Like not in a, not in a sort of conscious way of building a network, but just an appreciation for the value of relationships, like in your life in business and outside of business. Yeah. I mean, I, it is very important. It's the single most important thing for me in business. I wasn't, I didn't over index in any category as it relates to not, you know, as you would think it would relate to business. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been able to, to get, I think, to advance and move the ball downfield based on just authentic relationships. And really just, you know, one of the best things about being successful, having a little bit of money or whatever, is being able to spoil your friends and family and those that you care about and to help people. And I, I think I had that in me before, I, you know, anything, when I was living with my parents in my house, I think mm-hmm. I've always had that. And I think that, um, you know, it's translated into real good relationships. And, um, you know, at, in your 20s and 30s, you never know who's going to be in a position of power in your 40s and 50s. But the guys that I've come up with in my 20s, you know, there's always a couple of guys or gals that are in really big decision-making positions. And, um, you know, if you have those relationships, you maintain them and they're authentic, they'll be very rewarding. Mm-hmm. I feel like you understood that your 20s are a good time to really explore yourself and figure out what you really want to do before committing to anything, mm-hmm. as opposed to just getting on a train and trying to you know, sort of move up a corporate ladder. But I had to rely on meeting people. I had to rely on, you know, I didn't have an Ivy education or anything like that. I had to rely on those relationships. My 20s were spent meeting people and cultivating relationships, staying in touch, um, inviting people, including people that I liked, getting rid of people that I didn't like and and maintaining those friendships. And that was a huge part of my 20s. Mm-hmm. I mean, spending my my nights, you know, I, I tried to own the nights more than the days. What do you mean by that? You know, I, I want, those were, those were key hours for me in the 20s. That's when people were going out, going making out. friendships. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't about work. It was just about, you know, who you got along with. And, and I would go out all the time I wasn't a drinker, I wasn't a partier, um, but I would go out, I was out, I was active. I was re- getting phone numbers, returning calls, meeting people, inviting them, connecting dots. Um, and then I would, lean on the, I would lean on people when I needed, you know, people, people generally like to help people. Um, I'm seeing it with my book now. You know, so many of my friends have been so supportive, even people from 20 years ago. Um, so, 
You just don't yeah, know. You're getting like crazy like tweets. You know, you got Maria Shriver tweet. It was did yeah. Trump tweet your book? Trump, uh, LeBron. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's insane, man. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I, I and also I think you know, look, the book is a fun read. It's it a is. fun, funny. You can read. read it in like two hours, three hours, yeah, one sitting. It's really easy and fun to read. But people are doing it on their own, and I think it's out of a true appreciation for our genuine friendship. You know. Mm-hmm. I think most people are, you know, we're habits of routine and routine has its place. And, you know, I like routines and I'm productive in routines, but, you know, really the call to action of this book is, is to shake up your routine, to get out of your routine and to really, you know, take a look in the mirror and, uh, and, you know, challenge yourself to, you know, do something that makes you uncomfortable in a, you know, culture that values, you know, sort of security and comfort above all. You know, so there's all of that to overcome. Um, and I love that about it. And, you know, the, the, one of the things that, that really stuck with me that I think I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about is the, the Goggins accountability mirror. Yes. So tell me what that is. Well, he, he, I mean, he, he would always, he's been shaving his head and, and his face every morning since he's 18 years old because he wanted to be comfortable with the reflection in the mirror. He wanted to see his whole face and look into his soul and be comfortable with what he saw. And if he wasn't, he was going to make changes. And I think, you know, Goggins' whole thing is, you know, he's sick of of people feeling sorry for themselves. It's like, we have to be accountable for ourselves. There's an accountability mirror. That's what he looks in every day. Mm-hmm. And you got to be comfortable with your reflection in the mirror. And I, I you know, I agree with him. You know, we all, we're, we're, we live in a world of a lot of excuses and blame. Um, but where's the accountability? Mm-hmm. You know, like if you didn't run today, whose fault is that? You don't blame it on your schedule. Go and do it. Mm-hmm. So if someone's listening to this and they are one of those people that fall into that category of, you know, being in a rut or, or, or perhaps stuck in a job they don't like or circumstances that they feel like they don't have control over, you know, what is your call to action as the first step to, to shift that? It's just, you, you, you have to be willing to get uncomfortable to get better. And you have to just take that first step and, and to reap the rewards. And it, it, it really, you know, there's no silver bullet. It is nothing. There's nothing. It's you. And you have to just do it yourself. No one can tell you to do it. You can't list, read a book or this. You have to want to do it for you. And when you want to do it, you'll do it. You did it. Mm-hmm. Look what you did. You turned your whole life around from the bottom. But the, but pain is the motivator. You know what I mean? Like being in, I was in a sufficient enough pain that I was ready to make that shift. You know, how do you make that shift without the elevator going all the way down? And you were sick of you. You wanted a different you. You wanted a different you. So you got to want it. You got to want it, Mm -hmm. but you got to authentically want it. Not just say you want it. Thanks for talking to me, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, really appreciate it. The book is... Living with a seal. Uh, if you're digging on Jesse, the best way to connect with you is uh, you're at you're at the 100 Mile Man on Twitter. Yeah, and the website is the, the 100, 100 Mile Man, Man, the number 100, the number 100 Mile Man dot com. Yeah, and you're on Facebook and all those other places, yeah. right? You're easy easy guy to track down. All yeah. There. All right, cool. <laughs> uh, congrats on the book, man. It's really a great read. Everybody should pick it up and check it out. Uh, and. Uh, it will improve your life, I think, and at least make you think about stuff, I think, a little bit more deeply. So thank you. Thank you. Peace. Plants.